Hello, everybody, and welcome to the February 8th Classroom 2.0 Live show. My name is Lori Moffat. I'm one of the co-hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you, Tammy, for doing the closed captioning. Today's topic is the featured teacher topic, and Todd Nisloni will be the featured teacher. Uh, our live binder is here on this page. The link you won't be able to take, but as you see, the live binder tabs are down along the side. So each Classroom 2.0 live show does have a live binder. Whoops. The recordings are all posted at the Archives and Resources page on the Classroom 2.0 Live site at this, this link. We do always like to find out where in the world people are logging in from. So if you choose that pointer, I'm logging in from central Pennsylvania. I know Peggy's in Phoenix. Arizona, Tammy's in Southwest Arkansas. Now your pointer may cover the entire area, maybe even a whole state. You can type where you're located in the in the chat as well. And we do have some poll questions. Uh, the polling on the screen won't work. You'll have to use the polling near your name at the top of the participants list. Have you ever heard of the flipped classroom model? So this is a yes or no. Click either the green check for yes, the red X for no. And once people have voted, I will post this to the whiteboard. And it looks like those that voted have heard of the flipped classroom model. The next question, have you ever flipped a lesson before? Let me clear the previous ones first. Go ahead and answer that one. Have you ever flipped a lesson before? And again, I'll wait for votes. It looks like most people have voted. And mo those that voted, we've got a little bit more than a third have flipped a lesson. Third polling question, also yes or no, have you used project-based learning in your classroom? Yes or no? And again, out of those that have voted, almost half have. And again, our topic today is our featured teacher. And I will turn over the mic to Paula Noggle, who will introduce Todd. Sorry, everybody. There was a little delay with me getting the talk button. OK. Um, it is um, quite an honor to be able to introduce our featured teacher for this morning. Um, this gentleman and I um, met last summer at the Area 7 Tech Conference in White Oak, Texas. And then we met again at ISTE and um, had quite a lovely time talking with each other. I went to his presentations and learned more about what he does in his fifth grade classroom. 
And I just absolutely love his enthusiasm and his love of teaching and everything he does shines through. And I knew that I definitely wanted him to be part of my PLN. Imagine being able to interview our Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, for a podcast, meeting President Obama at the White House, and being named Teacher of the Year at your state tech conference. Well, Todd has done all of these and so much more. It is my pleasure to introduce the, T the newly named TCEA Teacher of the Year, a White House Champion of Change, the NFBA 20 to Watch, a CDE Top 40 Innovator, Classroom Champs Teacher, and a co-host of the Edu All Stars HQ, known as Tech Ninja Todd, or better yet, known as Todd Nesloni. Todd, we are thrilled to have you here. Well, I thank you so much for that introduction, Paula. It, it was weird hearing you say all that stuff. I, I, it's just overwhelming. It's been a crazy year. But thank you, Paula, for the kind words. I really, really appreciate it. <clears throat> and so I guess I will just go ahead and um, jump right into everything. Um, the newbie question for this week was, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Um, to me, Web 2.0 tools are tools that I can use with my students to have them creating something. I am very passionate about using technology, not just to have them play on an iPad with an app or get on a computer and do a website, but to have them create something that they can share with the world at large. And so that's what a Web 2.0 tool means to me. And like I just said, I use them all the time to um, have my kids create stuff that the, they can share with other classrooms around the country or around the world, or even with just their parents. Sorry, I clicked. <laughs> so the what I'm I guess what I just was kind of kind of focused on today was just the flipped classroom, project based learning, and kind of my journey into how everything has played out. Um, I was at the end of my fifth year of teaching a few years ago, and I was planning on leaving the profession. Um, I had had an extremely successful run. Uh, my state scores, uh, my, fi my fifth year of teaching, I had 100% of my fifth graders pass. I had 75% of them gain a commended score on their standardized exam. My district loved me. They supported me. Everything was wonderful. But I hated my job, uh, mainly because I didn't like that I was pushing worksheets, and I didn't like that I was teaching a test. So on paper, it looked like I was extremely successful, but in my heart, I knew that's not why I became a teacher. I didn't become a teacher so that I could push worksheets and teach a test. And so I couldn't see a way out of it and still get those scores that my district so heavily desired. And so I decided I wasn't going to teach anymore. I was going to try to find another way to work with kids. Then my friend and partner in crime, Stacy Huffine, um, she, on Twitter, she's Tech Ninja Stacy. She came to me um, at that year and she said, "You know what? I know you're struggling. I know you're trying hard to find a way to keep going." She said, "But I've heard about this flipped classroom thing, and I think that you would love it. I think it's right up your alley. I think this is what could change everything around for you." So she showed me to a webinar. I went and I watched the webinar. Fell in love with the idea of what I could do with flipped classroom. And I went straight to my, uh, I, I, well, actually, I uh, went to my principal at the time and told her, and we talked through some things. Because just to give you a little background on my school and my students, we are the third largest school district in the state of Texas, square miles wise, not student population wise. Um, we have a lot of students that ride over an hour on the bus to school every morning and ride over an hour on the bus home every day. Um, they do not. About 50% of my students do not have internet at home, either because they can't afford it or they live in the middle of nowhere where there is no internet. Um, we are not one-to-one. -one. We are not a wealthy district by any means. So we face a lot of the similar uh, deficiencies that a lot of other districts face. And so when I talk about a lot of the things, people get, begin to think that I have an extremely wealthy student population. I've got all this amazing tech. And so we, we really, I, I like to share at the beginning that that's not what we're working with, that we've learned how to work around a lot of this stuff and still find ways to be successful. Because truly, a successful teacher can be creative and work around any aspect and figure out what they're doing and how to make it work. Um, 
So I went to my principal, we talked through the pros and cons, figured out what we do. Because the other thing about my district is my district is a very conservative district. And so my district, uh, and this, was, this is a very unique and new idea. And so I knew I would have people in my district scared. But a lot of my parents, and I don't mean this in a negative way at all, but a lot of my parents are very uneducated when it comes to technology. And because of that, there's a lot of fear with things that are different and things that involve technology. And so what I had to do was I had to really prepare myself to be able to deal with that because I knew parents would be um, apprehensive about this new style of teaching, not because it wouldn't work, but because maybe they were uncomfortable or didn't fully understand it. And so as I went through the year, the biggest thing that I learned about getting parents on your side with a flipped classroom is making sure that you keep them in the loop the entire time. Um, I used to always say that I was a closed door teacher. I believed that it was easier to ask forgiveness than it was to ask permission. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing because I didn't want anybody to come in and tell me, you can't do that. Our district's not ready for that. We're going to block that website. So I kept my mouth shut and I kept my door shut. When I decided to start flipping my classroom, I realized that I had to really step it up and start sharing what I was doing. And my assistant superintendent at the time, Troy Mooney, really encouraged me to get out there and start sharing it. And so one really big thing that we've done to alleviate parent stress is I've op opened my door wide. Uh, my class has a class Instagram. We have a class Twitter account. I tweet from my own account. I have a Facebook group. I have a um, my website, I blog all the time, and also we do a flip class open house throughout the year where I tell the parents, hey, during this time your kid is going to be with me, and so <clears throat> what I want you to do is if you want to come and hang out with us, you can come and hang out with us and we will, uh, and I'll, I'll show you what, what's going on. When you do that and you open up all those doors, um, then what it does is it, it makes the parents feel like you're not hiding anything. And what I found is the easiest way to communicate with parents too, with, who don't, may not have all that tech and all that internet, is a service called Remind 101, which allows you to text parents and students without ever needing their phone number, and they never need yours. And it's a one-way communication. So it's given me an opportunity to keep them in the loop. And when you keep them in the loop, they trust you, and they give you a lot more leeway to try these creative things with your kids. Um, I also went to my assistant superintendent and my district technologist and told them what I was doing. That was absolutely terrifying. And when I told them, the first word out of their mouth was, why are you telling me? Well, because I know that parents no longer go to the teacher when they have an issue, at least not in our district. And a lot of times, they don't go to the principal either. They go straight to the superintendent or the school board or somebody else that's big and in charge. And so I knew that I would have parents nervous and apprehensive, so I decided to beat them to the punch and go straight to the people in charge and say, look, I'm going to tell you completely exactly what I'm doing so you can be all on the same page as me and so that we can be ready to go with all of this. Um, <clears throat> and it really worked out well in my favor because I did have a parent that went about three weeks into school and complained about some things that she thought I was doing or not instructing well enough on. And my assistant superintendent was able to step in and say, that's not true. This is what's really happening. Here's what's going on. If you have any issues, you can go to his room and talk to him. And so in a small community like mine, when that happens once, the word gets out that parents can't go over my head anymore, and then I don't have to worry about um, that anymore. Um, flipping the classroom, I, the way I always, when I talk about flipping the classroom, I always make sure that people who are listening know that the way I am going to explain how I do it is not a one-size-fits-all model. Um, I always tell teachers, you can talk to any flip class teacher you want. None of us will flip our classroom the same way. We all do things very differently. And so what you have to do is you have to find what's comfortable for you and your technology and your students and use that when deciding how you're going to flip. Don't try to do everything I'm doing because I have been told often that um, it, it, I'm a little insane when it comes to the things that I've done. And so um, don't try to do everything I'm telling you to do. Another great resource, recently I was invited to collaborate on a book called Flipping 2.0. Um, it gets teachers from all around the nation uh, who are flipping their classroom. We each wrote chapters over our subject area and things like that. And that's really a good resource for getting uh, multiple ideas of what to do. Um, I started flipping completely from day one because I'm one that if I'm going to go and put the work in, I'm just going to do all of it. Um, another thing that I tell teachers is that, you know what, if you're not comfortable with going all in because there's many people that aren't, then what you need to do is pick your favorite lesson. 
And after you pick your favorite lesson, just flip that one lesson. Get comfortable with use something you're comfortable with. Try out the technology. See what your kids are ready for and your parents are ready for. You don't have to jump in all at once and kind of trial by error like I did. Um, but I mean, just use what works for you. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I, I get a lot of questions from is uh, younger elementary teachers, like K1 and 2 teachers, like to ask, well, this sounds great, but I don't know how to flip for my kids. And the thing that I tell them is that when you flip a younger classroom, like a K1 or 2 classroom, you're not flipping for the kids. You're flipping for the parents. You're teaching them about phonemic awareness and addition and subtraction. And you're filling them in on what is going on in your classroom. So yes, younger grade levels can flip their classroom too, but it's a different perspective that you have to take. Um, I will say that I have many parents watch their videos with their children in my grade level as well. Because you know we always have those parents who say, I graduated so many years ago, I don't remember how to do it, or I, um, I, I never even graduated junior high. There's no way I could do that. And so we really focus on that. Um, the biggest thing for me that I like to relay with people with flipping the classroom, though, is a lot of focus has been put on the video aspect of flipping a classroom. In my mind, the videos take up 10% of what a flipped classroom is. 90% of what it actually is is it is what, what the kids are now able to do in class because of the videos. Many people view flipped classroom as, oh, I can send the kids home, watch a video, and then in class we can do all these great worksheets and stuff because now my kids have an idea of what we're doing. I completely disagree with that, and I think it's the people that are flipping like that are doing a real disservice to their children um, because when flipping the classroom, what you're able to do is you're able to have them go home and watch that video. And by the way, that video is meant for a foundation. It is not meant for mastery. And that's something I had to explicitly state to my students and parents because a lot of them thought that because we were doing the instruction via videos at home that they had to have it mastered by watching it. And I really had to talk to them a lot about how, you know, no, I just want to build a foundation with you right now. If you didn't understand a word of my video, that's okay. Because you know what? You're coming to my class the next day, and we're going to be hands-on, inquiry, project-based, creation-based learning. We're going to get messy, and we'll learn that way. And so I had to really tell my parents that the, found that the videos were made for a foundation. The other big thing is your videos should never be longer than 10 minutes, ever longer than 10 minutes. Because if your videos are longer than 10 minutes, you're not going to get your kids to watch them. And I know there's people who say, oh, it's the kid's age plus two. That's how long their attention span is. Or it's their grade plus five or whatever it is. I can tell you right now, you're not going to keep a kid's attention for more than 10 minutes, period, end of story. Um, you can, I can barely keep attention to an instructional video for more than 10 minutes. But people ask me, how do you get all your instruction into a video that's less than 10 minutes? Well, my class times are about an hour long, and when I did teach traditionally, <clears throat> I would have to say, turn around, get your stuff out, stop talking, the bell's ringing, the phone's ringing, you have to go to the bathroom, let's do these six examples. All of that takes a lot more time than you think it does. With a video, I do a brief instruction, I mean a brief intro, and then I do one example, and that's it. After that one example, then it's done. If you need to see it again, rewind it and watch it again. You don't have to do multiple examples in a video. Then when they come to class, we jump into other things. But the videos do play a part, but they are not the whole thing. So I don't want you to get confused thinking that, oh man, everybody focuses on these videos. They do play a part. Um, <clears throat> real quick, I'm going to go ahead and try to do this app sharing, see if I can get this to work. So hopefully, right now, you can see my website. Um, that's what I have available. Um, it's toddnesloney.com, and I know it's on the Live Finder as well. Um, on the top of my page, I have some uh, titles, some links. On the About Me page, that's where you can find out more info about the Flipping 2.0 book. But my Flipped Classroom link, that is the link where I've created a page that provides you with a lot of resources um, to use to help you successfully flip. Um, I'm going to talk about Sophia here in a minute, but I do webinars with them as well, all about the flipped classroom. So if what I'm saying talks too fast or you need access to other webinars, there's three webinars I've done with them in the last year. That you, those are clickable links that you can click on and um, watch with them. 
On my page, I also have an interview with nine of my fifth graders from last year um, where they talk about what they like and what they don't like. So it's a good perspective from kids about what worked and didn't work. On the side, I've also provided you with some resources like a flip class parent letter in English and Spanish, a WISC, which I'll talk about in a minute, and how we use iTunes U and Instagram. And so you can take any of those and use them. The one thing I always tell people is if you use anything from my website, take it and claim it as your own. I am not in education to gain fame, and I'm not in education for credit. And so you can take anything of mine that you want and use it and not change a word and put your name on it. I don't care. I'm not trying to make money off of any of this, so it doesn't bother me at all. So take it and use it. I'm trying to help teachers out um, like I had help. Um, you'll also see that I have a link to a YouTube page. That YouTube page is a page that, that has my students creation videos on it that they create. Um, if you need a link to my YouTube, I know it was in the chat, it's on the live binder, but I also have all my social media links at the very bottom of every one of my pages on my website. Um, <clears throat> but when it, when it comes to using resources as well, I always like to show people uh, my 3 Tech Ninjas website that I started with Stacy Huffheim. On that website, we have a bunch of Web 2.0 tools that we found, and one of our Web 2.0 categories is a category called Flipped Classroom. And so if you go to that page on our Ninja site, it has a bunch of links to some great fl uh, Flipped Classroom tools. Two of them that I'm going to talk about right now are how to even begin making your videos. When you begin making your videos, you have to use a screen recording tool if that's the way you're going to want to make your videos. That's how I make mine. When I started flipping my classroom, I used a tool called Screencast-O-Matic. It is a free tool that allows you to record videos up to 15 minutes long. <clears throat> Since it is free, there is no editing. It's a one, one take done, um, and you can download the video when you're done or upload it to your YouTube channel. There's also no picture in picture because it is the free version. I started using it at the beginning of the year because it was easy. If you're not familiar with screen recording, all it does is record your computer screen and record your voice. You don't ever see yourself. So for those of you who don't like watching yourself, it's a great way to do this without having to see yourself. Um, but I love using Screencast-O-Matic. Then I got uh, heard about Camtasia. Camtasia is made by TechSmith, who does uh, Snagit, Jing, Coach's Eye, stuff like that. You can get a 30-day trial for free in hopes to convince your administration about the awesome things you can do with it. It is about a hundred and something dollars, but the more your district buys, the cheaper it gets kind of thing. I love Camtasia, and it is definitely worth the money because of the amount of things that you can do with your videos. You can add images. You can add a uh, 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 animations. You can edit your videos. You can do picture in picture. You can add quizzes in the middle of your videos. There's so many things that you can do that make Camtasia a really great product. Um, I, when I make my videos, I, I we have smart boards in my school, and I don't make any of my videos at home. I make them at school. I get there about an hour, hour and a half early, and make my videos. A five minute video takes me seven minutes to make. I open up Smart Notebook on my smart board and I start Screencast-O-Matic or Camtasia and then just start doing the work on the smart board as if my students were in the class at that time. And it's recording everything that I do, press stop, and I'm done. It really is that easy. Now I told you a four to five minute video takes me six to seven minutes to make because I don't go back and do any editing of any of my videos. They are done in one take. And I do that very purposefully. Many times our students, especially with a math teacher, they view math teacher as a perfect, as a genius, and as somebody they have to live up to. And what I want my students to see is that the classroom is not my classroom, it's their classroom. And it has to be an environment that they feel safe in, that they feel valued in, and that they are able to feel like they can take risks in. And to do that, I make mistakes in my videos, sometimes on purpose, and sometimes not on purpose, but I find out later I made a mistake. Um, but I do that to let my students see that I make mistakes as well and that I do things that don't always work out for me. Um, but I learn from them, I pick myself up, and I keep going. And so it's been really good for my students to, to see that I can make those mistakes. Um, I do know that my students have come in before and said, hey, you know you did this entire problem wrong. And I've had to say, uh, no, I didn't know that. Let's watch it and see it. And so I see it and I, we laugh about it and then we go on. And those smart aleck kids of yours, they'll watch the videos even more closely when they figure out that you're making mistakes so that they can make fun of you. So it's a great dual process thing. 
Um, when I make my videos, I put them in several different locations for my students to access. And again, I do that very purposefully because you, I, you will never walk into a room full of adults and have every single adult on the same device. And so when I hear teachers that it just drives me insane to walk into a classroom and hear somebody say, every single student will use this website. Every single student will use this device. It's not real world, and when you do that, you're going to lose about 30% of your kids because of the fact that they're either not going to want to use that device or tool, or they're not comfortable with it. And so what I do is, yes, it takes me an extra 10 minutes max to put my videos in all these different places, so it's not that time consuming. But the number one place I put videos is YouTube. Um, I love YouTube. The kids are comfortable with YouTube. But again, I know that YouTube has a stigma attached to many parents. And so what I try not to do is not have parents be turned off because of the resource I'm using. So we don't just use YouTube. It also doesn't help that YouTube is blocked in my district, and so my kids can't access the videos anyway at school. So I also put them in a place called Sophia. I absolutely love Sophia. Um, it's Sophia.org, but our, this link is clickable to them as well. Um, but Sophia is a great web platform that houses your videos for you. It's never been blocked in any district that I've been in. And so I upload all my videos. Now what I really like about Sophia, though, is that you can get Flip Class certified, like I am, for free on Sophia. And if you have Chromebooks, Chromebook certified for free. Do you have iPads? iPad certified for free. You get a certificate endorsed by Capella University. You get a nice free t-shirt. And it's easy. You watch some videos, make your own video, and you're done. It's not anything that's ex ex extremely time, uh, time, it doesn't need a lot of your time. Wow, I'm stumbling on my words today. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but it's a great resource. Um, let me see if I can show you what it looks like for me. So when I go to Sophia and I log in, um, and I know it may be loading a little low. And I'm, this is the last thing I'm going to show you using the app sharing, and then I'll go back to the slides. So if you don't have the app sharing working, I apologize in advance. But with Sophia, what it does is it allows me to create a tutorial. And I can create groups in Sophia. If you're familiar with Edmodo, in Edmodo, when you create a group, you get a group code, and you give it to your kids. In Sophia, when you create a group, you get a group code, and you give it to your kids. Your kids do not need an email to sign up for Sophia. There is nothing about Sophia that costs any money unless you want to get college credit. Then, of course, you're going to have to pay for that. But Bill Nye, the science guy, is a partner with Sophia now, so he's got content on there. And there's about 37,000 videos made by teachers, four other teachers, and four students. So it has a plethora of resources. But I create a tutorial. And so I can name it, I can add a picture, I can add an objective, I can Facebook share it, tweet it, Pinterest it, Google uh, Plus it, I can embed it in a website, I can email it out. I embed my video directly within my playlist. But the thing I love about Sophia the most is underneath the video, I can embed anything I want. I can embed a PowerPoint, a Google Doc, a Google Form a Word document. I can embed anything I want underneath. And so everything is all in one place. Because with YouTube, when my kids watch a video, they got to click a link here, and click a link here, and click a link here. And my kids get lost within the links very quickly. 60% of my students prefer Sophia because of the fact that everything's in one spot. So that I can put everything right there. At the bottom of every tutorial, the kids can ask questions. And I can get an email letting me know uh, what questions they have. And the other thing I really like, is that I can add a quiz to every one of my tutorials. And so the kids have to take a quiz to be able to access the next tutorial. But my favorite part about Sophia is the video analytics. So with Sophia, I can see who is watching my video, but better yet, I can see exactly how long they're watching the video. So when Johnny comes in and says he didn't get something, I can pull it up and say, oh, well, you only watched 17 seconds. Of course you didn't get what was in that video. So it's a great resource. The other thing that I use for videos, and I'll go ahead and stop the um, sharing because I don't need to share this anymore. So the other thing that, I've, uh, that I really uh, like to use with my students is an app called iTunes U. And so with iTunes U, my students who have Apple devices, iOS devices, can download the app for free, access my course, and then when they use the Wi-Fi at the school, they can download the videos directly to the app. Meaning, when they go home with that same device, they do not need internet at home to watch the videos because they've been downloaded to the app. 
So it's a really great resource to have as well. I do utilize Edmodo. Edmodo is used as my central communication hub to kind of keep everything in track. Why do I upload to several different platforms? I upload to several different platforms because my class is a class full of no excuses. You're not going to have any reason why you didn't watch my videos. If YouTube was down, you could have logged into Sophia. If you forgot your login to Sophia, you could have used the iTunes U app. If you don't have the iTunes U app, you could have used YouTube. So there's no excuses on why you didn't watch my videos. I've given you multiple ways to access them. A popular question that I get, though, is after accessing the videos, how do I even know if the students watch them? And let me pause real quick and backtrack. What do I do for my kids that do not have internet? And so the first way I'd like for my kids to access the videos, of course, is by internet. If they don't have internet, then the next thing that I do is some of them have a computer, either because they anticipate getting internet or because they just want a computer. And so they bring a flash drive and I throw the videos on a flash drive and send it back home with them. <clears throat> what I learned about my students and a conversation we had to have is when I assigned my first video, several of my kids who said they had internet said they didn't watch the video because it took a few hours to load. And I said, okay, well then clearly you're doing something wrong. So let's go see what you're doing wrong. And they said, no, we have this thing called dial-up, and that's how long it takes. I did not realize that dial-up still existed. But a large population of my students, that's what they have as their internet resource. Now, if you've used dial-up recently, you will know that you cannot use dial-up to access videos. And so we, we had to have a discussion of, kids, if you have dial-up, you do not have internet. We're not going to consider that as internet. We're going to pretend like that's not internet because it's just like really not having internet. And so what I did was I started burning DVDs for my kids because a lot of them did have DVD players at home if they didn't have internet. But again, I also had to have the conversation with my kids because some of them said they didn't have a DVD player. And this is a very generational thing right here. When, I said, when they said that, I said, really? But you play Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. What do you mean you don't have a DVD player? And they said, well, yeah, that plays DVDs, but that's not a DVD player. And so I had to have the conversation with them of <clears throat> that is a DVD player because it plays DVDs. But kids don't see it as that. They see it as a game system. And so I had to really have that conversation with them. So I burned DVDs for my kids. Now, the first year with flipping is a lot of work. I was trying to make three videos at a time to stay a little bit in advance. And so with the DVDs, the, my first year, I was having to burn rewritable DVDs. So I would burn three videos, they would take it home, bring it back, and I could reburn them because they were rewritable. Now, I just burn one DVD at the beginning of the year because all my videos are already made and send that one DVD home with all my kids. And so they can all watch it that way. <clears throat> Now, I did have two kids who did not have DVD players. And so we had a class set of iPod Nanos that my principal allowed me to check out to the students for the, it was a campus set. And so I checked out to the kids, and they took them home and watched them. We didn't ever have any Nano, lost, broken, scratched, or stolen. And even though the screen was tiny, you know, we do what we have to do to make it work. We don't always have the best things, but we're going to make it work with what we have. Now, I did have one parent um, that did not want her child to bring home any technology that she would have to pay for if it was lost. And so I am very blunt with parents and very honest with parents. I always let them know that I'm looking out for the best interests of their child, and if I'm within the state law and the school handbook, then I, it's my class and we're going to do things my way. And so when I met with that parent, I said, look, I tried to provide you with internet, with a computer, with a DVD, and even with my own technology. And what happened was is that you didn't like any of those. And now, because you wouldn't do any of those things, um, <clears throat> you are going to have to bring your child before school or after school to watch the videos. Now, the videos are never longer than 10 minutes. So I need you to bring your uh, kid maybe 15 minutes early or 15 minutes after. And guess what? I don't assign a video every night. It's two to three nights a week max. Some weeks there's only one video. And so it's not a big time commitment. And so the parent said, you know what? You're right. And so as soon as she brought her kid three times, she said, okay, I'm done with this. Check me out a nano. I'll just make sure that my kid doesn't lose it. And so it really helped doing that as well. And so um, <clears throat> that's the kind of way it works. Um, I do not send any homework home besides the video. Um, I used to be a big believer in homework. Um, I even did my master's thesis about the importance of homework. 
Now I'm very a uh, complete 180 on that. I don't see any value in homework at all because the kids we're really sending the homework home for are the struggling kids, and if they're struggling, they're not going to know how to do the homework anyway. So we're just frustrating them and making them hate a subject because they already struggle. And so the videos, I know some people view the videos as a type of homework, but it's a homework that takes five minutes. You're just watching something, building that foundation, and that's all I ever assign. Now when the kids do the videos, how do I even know they're watching them? Well, I make them do this thing called a WISC, a W-S-Q, and there's a link to it on my website. Um, it came up from Crystal Kirch, who is a uh, high school math teacher in California. She came up with it, and it's used by almost every um, flip class teacher that I know. Um, the W in WISC, the kids have to fill it out. Um, the W stands for watch. When and where did you watch your video? On the bus, in the car, 10 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. When did you watch it? Then the S stands for summary. Uh, write a summary of the video. It's very difficult to get kids how to do that, but it's a really important thing to get them to write a summary to make sure they're actually watching the video. And the Q in WISC stands for question. What question did you have after watching the video? Now when you do that, you're going to have two groups of kids, your GTs and your smart Alex, who are going to say, I didn't have a question after watching the video. And so I say, okay, create a question somebody else might have had so that you can still do that piece. Well, then your GT kids do that, and your smart Alex say, if I didn't have a question, how am I supposed to know what somebody else was going to ask? And I say, you know what? You're right. And so what I want you to do is to create a question over something you, of, of how this would be asked on an exam. And so that no matter what, they still have that questioning piece completed, because to me, that is the most important part uh, about the, doing the WISC. Now, when my kids do the WISCs, again, it's all about meeting them where they're at and differentiating without any extra work on my end. I do not make the kids all write a whisk. You can write it on a piece of paper. You can type it on your device. You can email it to me. You can text it to me. You can type it up and print it out and bring it to me. I have a Google form that you can flip out and do that. Um, the other thing I do is, you know, this year my kids have gotten really, I have a really creative group this year, and they found some interesting ways to do their WISC that they asked that they could do, and I would have never thought of it. One of my students has his parent record him a uh, video talking about his summary and his question because he doesn't like to write. You know what? That's perfect. Do that. Great. I have another kid who uses a device to audioly record himself saying the WISC because he doesn't want to be on camera either. Another thing that I had a kid do that I thought was brilliant is he loses his homework every single time we do homework, every time. And so he said, can I do my whisk and then take a picture of it with my device and then just bring that picture in case I lose my paper copy? And my thing is, I don't care how you get it to me, bring it to me. Do whatever's comfortable for you. These, uh, us teachers, when we say you can only do it our way, we are asking for excuses. We are asking for students not to do it. And so with, with, with the students like this, I'm letting them do it however they want and just bring it to me. And then we spend the first 10 minutes of class going over those whisks in small groups of four. They share their summary, they share each other's questions, and they do all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and so um, what we do is what each group picks their best summary, and each group has the best summary stand up and share. What just happened was the kids watched the video over me, they heard four people in their group share their summary, and they heard five groups share their summary as well. And so the kids are sharing the same thing at least ten times, because we know those kids that you can repeat the same thing over to them, and they won't get it, and then when somebody else walks up and says it, they get it. And so doing that, hopefully they get it from someone else. Now, what do I do with the kids that don't watch their videos or do their with? Well, I have a plan for that as well. When you show up to class, we spend the first 10 minutes of class going over our WISC. If you didn't do it or watch your video, you go to the back of the room and get on a computer or some type of device and you watch your video. And guess what? You will not be joining us for class today. Since we are a completely project-based class, we do zero worksheets and zero test formatted questions. We are all about creating with our hands. And so that student that didn't do their video, they get a stack of worksheets and they sit back in the back of the classroom and see what they're going to be missing that day during class. I've never had a parent complain because if they did, I would have said, I did worksheets for five years. Why is it a problem now? And if you don't like your child doing this, then have them watch the video and then they won't have to do this. Um, but the thing is, 
I have had teachers come to me and say, I tried to implement that and it didn't work. My students still don't watch the videos. And here's what I say, and this is difficult for some teachers to hear, but it's honest and it's real. One, one resource that I suggest for every teacher is to read the book Teach Like a Pirate by Dave Burgess. It is an absolutely incredible book that talks about finding your passion, teaching your passion, and, do, and, and making sure that you're passionate in class so that you can uh, relay that over to your kids. And for those teachers that tell me that their kids don't mind missing their class, here's what I say. If your class is not exciting and enticing, they are not going to want, they don't care that they miss your class. I try to make my class as crazy and fun as possible so that when you don't do your videos, you are so angry you don't get to do what we're doing in class today. And you're going to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so it's, it's a really great way to get your kids to want to be there because that's the reason they're not doing this stuff is because they don't really want to be there. And so I have to entice them and get them involved. Um, but that's how I really, and I have 75 students. And I have about three to five students every video who don't watch it. And they have two reasons. One reason is because they didn't feel like it or because they didn't want to. And the other reason, um, and this happens with a lot of my students, is they come up to me and say, you know, mom and dad got in a fight last night. We had to go stay at a hotel. And I didn't have a chance to watch my videos because we didn't have any tech at the hotel. And I tell, and the first group of students, I tell them, you know what, I don't care, get on a computer. The second group who has that parent issue, I look at them and I say, you know what, I'm so sorry that that happened. It could happen again. What are some things that we can do to be ready for that if it happens again? And we talk about that and we prepare. And I tell them that, you know, and, and I'm really sorry that happened, but you're still going to have to go to the back of the room and get on a computer and miss class today. And here's why I do that. Elementary teachers, I think, have the biggest hearts. And many times when kids come up to us with really sad or hurtful stories, our heart breaks for them and we allow ourselves and we allow them to make excuses for themselves based on their environment or where they come from. And I come from an environment very similar to theirs, so I can speak very honestly on this, saying that you, we have to train children that the environment they come from does not define them and does not allow them to make excuses for not getting their things done they need to get done. And when we baby them and tell them, oh, it's okay, let's go over this, we're telling them your environment is destroying you and that's okay. And we cannot tell them that. And so when I have those kids, I, usually they're the ones that are at school early. And I say, you know what? You got to school at 730 in the morning. You didn't come down to my room to do your videos. You have the opportunity to miss recess to come and get your stuff done. You chose not to take that advice either. And you also know that we have five to ten minutes between classes. You could have ran in, said, I didn't watch my video. Can I watch it real quick? And we would have been, we would have been good. But you let your environment make an excuse for you, and you can't do that. We have to be raising these kids to be successful in a world that isn't always going to care what's going on at home. It's just going to want them to get the job done. And so I do it in a very loving and caring way, but I also let them know that they have to be able to step up and say, these terrible things are happening in my life, but I can rise above and I can find ways to work around it. It's not going to sit there and destroy me and allow me to make excuses for the rest of my life. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now, sorry. <laughs> but jumping into PBO real quick, and I know I'm running out of time, so I won't go into too much with this. Um, PBO has completely revolutionized me because it's allowed me to get hands-on and dirty with my kids and allow them to create. Um, when I get, when I, where do I find my projects is a popular question that I get. Um, Pinterest is a great place. I don't ever feel like there's any ready-to-go projects on there, but I get a lot of great starter ideas for Pinterest. Educlipper is also another great one um, to use. It's also a great collaborative tool for combining and gaining resources. It's an iPad app, and now you can also, I think, create um, portfolios, digital portfolios within it. It's a great tool. My number one thing that has helped me become successful, though, is Twitter. Um, I got active on Twitter about a year and a half ago, and it has 
rocked my world. Um, I have the only reason I am successful in what I am doing is because I have the most incredible, amazing people that I surround myself with that are all virtual friends. Um, and many of them are my real life friends, and several of them are my best friends. And I cannot even believe um, the the power that Twitter has had over my career. I would not have been able to flip my class without Twitter. Um, a great positive, a great hashtag is hashtag flip class. Um, that's where I was able to connect with a bunch of other teachers who were flipping and learn from their stories and get ideas from them and connect with them, and that really helped me um, get successful. Um, and I'll go ahead and type it in the chat too, um, just so everybody knows. Um, but Flip Class, I think, is the most popular one used. I'm not. I'm, there's probably others as well. Um, and one thing I always tell people: if you, we live in the information age. So when you are choosing not to connect yourself to other brilliant minds, you are being defiant and choosing to be ignorant in the aspect of connecting. Because we live in the world of Google. And it's just like I tell my mom, who's also a teacher, in learning how to connect. If you don't know how to tweet, Google, how do I tweet? If you don't know what a hashtag is, Google, what is a hashtag? Your answers are there for you, but you have to take the step to learn. And Twitter has allowed me professional development 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Absolutely the best resource I will ever tell anybody to go to. Um, because there are so many incredible people on there. Um, and I just continually use it when I don't know, and I can't think of an idea, or I can't figure out something to do. I tweet it out to my people that are following it. Um, and if you're one of those that t Twitter scares you and you're still nervous about it, contact me. I will do a Google Hangout with you. I will do a Skype with you. I will train you how to use it because I'm that pa passionate in the power that there is with connecting with others that I am willing to give up my time to teach you how to use it. Um, I, with my projects, I really, I'm very passionate about providing my projects. Um, I do not use any rubrics with my projects. Um, I know that's a little controversial to some. My reading teacher is also project based and she uses rubrics and loves it. And I say good for her. Um, I'm not against rubrics at all. Just for me, I don't use a rubric. I do use a guideline plan which provides a, a, a framework of what I'm expecting. But the reason I don't use any rubrics is because of the fact that I feel like with what I'm trying to design in my classroom, which is all about creativity and thinking outside the box if you're learning, I feel like a rubric uh, stifles some of that creativity because it makes them see just exactly what I want from them. And I don't want them to always know exactly what I want. I want them to go through the path and figuring it out on their own because you don't learn unless you fail and you don't learn unless you struggle and you don't appreciate the learning without the struggle. And so I just provide this framework of an idea and it's been really great because I'm learning along with my kids because they're doing these amazing things that I never even would have thought of if I didn't allow them the freedom to think outside the box and be creative. I also don't ever grade any of my projects and again I do that very purposefully um, because of the fact that I don't want them to associate success with a grade. I want them to, uh, to keep working at it until they find success. Now I do have to have grades every six weeks. I have to have so many and so I do still do grades. Um, but I do, I do random quizzes. I do uh, math fact quizzes. I do vocabulary things. So I still get grades that are reflective of where they're at, but the grades don't come from the projects. Um, because I want them to think outside the box um, and not be afraid of doing something wild because it may make them fail. And with projects, I don't accept a project unless it's done right. So you may turn in a project five times before I finally accept it. And so I don't feel that it's fair for me to grade on your first shot if um, you had six more shots and got it right on the sixth one. Why would I give you a 20 in the grade book when at the end you have 100? And so I really want them to think outside the box. The other thing I do is every project that we do, they have a three question limit. You cannot ask me more than three questions. And if you need to go to the bathroom, that's a question. If you need to borrow a pencil, that's a question. I do that very purposefully as well because I keep, I get a lot of kids that have been very babied and breaking them out of that is very difficult. Nothing about the flipped classroom and project based learning is easy. I don't want anybody to get a false idea. It is hard work. It is frustrating work. Um, I have been banging my head a lot. I make a lot of mistakes. I have a lot of failures with what I'm doing, but I have a lot of successes as well. So I just want you to know it is a lot of work. 
Um, <clears throat> but back to what I was saying, which I totally went blank now, and Stacy's not here to get me back on track. Um, oh, the three questions. So with the three questions, we do that because I have a lot of kids who say, where do I put my name? Can I do it like this? Is this okay? Can I do this? And they're working in groups, but they don't even ask their group. And I'm trying to teach them to collaborate. And they're so used to having the teacher tell them everything that they don't even think about collaborating. And we do everything in groups. There is nothing done in my class that is solo unless it is a quiz or a test. Every single thing is in groups because I'm that firm believer that they have to verbalize to be able to internalize, especially with math. And so I really want them to be involved with, with, with talking through their learning. Um, and so we do, we do a lot of great projects, a lot of fun things. Um, I, have, I, I could go into detail for hours and hours, but I wanted you to have a way to connect with me as well. Um, my website has some resources. Um, you can email me. You can tweet me. Um, as uh, Paula so kindly stated earlier, I also do a weekly podcast series, and Paula was a guest um, on Edu called Edu All Stars, where we interview um, inspiring people who we feel are difference makers in education. It's a great positive, uplifting place to go and hear from other people who are learning um, and just like us. And so I definitely encourage you to check them out. They're also on iTunes. You can just search Edu All Stars. And then like I showed you earlier, our 3 Tech Ninjas website where we have a ton of really great um, resources and Web 2.0 tools for you to utilize that are categorized, easy to find, and we've identified that they're apps as well. Um, I also want to say thank you to the Classroom uh, 2.0 team for even allowing me to be here today. Um, I love sharing about the things that we're doing in my class. Um, and my kids are the most incredible, awesome kids in the world, um, and they are the reason we are successful. It is not me at all. It is because my kids are rock stars. And so any award that I have ever received or recognition goes completely to my kids and the people that I work with and the PLN that I've collected, connected with online. And so I guess now we do questions. I don't know how to get to the questions. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks so much, Todd. I did collect some questions as we were going through, and a couple of them were already answered. Uh, the first one that came up, there's a lot of practical data, but is there research that shows flipping improves student achievement? Are you planning any action research? That's funny. I, I, I forgot to even talk about that, and that's one of the things I usually talk about. Um, test scores are very important in the state of Texas, and like many states, and especially within, our, within the districts. And so um, when doing this, my district was very scared about letting me to do this because I've had excellent scores, and they were afraid that I wasn't going to have them because I was doing something different. Um, the state of Texas, we take a fifth grade math test. Um, after going completely project-based with no test formatted questions and no worksheets, um, we, the state of Texas scored 75% passing in fifth grade math on the first administration. My district, which has five elementaries, scored 81% passing on the first administration for fifth grade math. My campus, which is my students, scored 96% passing on the first administration. I had 72 or 73 of my 75 students pass on the first try. And that's with teaching no test formatted questions, no worksheets. We were still able to make us a really successful class. Because with the way testing works, if you are teaching the kids your standards and you are having them get in there and identify and, and work with them and learn them inside and out instead of learning a multiple choice answer, they are going to be successful on an exam because they are going to know that knowledge inside and out. And so we, have a, we use all that data to show that, you know, I, I'm not a strong believer in standardized testing. I like it. I think it gives me a great baseline, but I don't think it works for every kid. But I know our districts and state don't really care about what we think about data. That's still what they're looking at. And so I usually don't go into too much on my soapbox about it, but we do have the data that backs up what we're doing is successful. Thanks. I think this was answered, but I'll ask it anyway. What type of microphone do you use when you do your, your video recordings? Um, it kind of depends on whatever I did not leave at home that day. Ah. Um, I either use a really long corded mic or I will just use the built-in microphone on the laptop. Mm -hmm. Okay. What can you be certified with Sophia again? You can get Flip Classroom certified. You can get iPad certified and Chromebook certified. I 
I think this was this was answered. It doesn't sound like you assign points to your projects, uh, but somebody asked how how do you assign points, then justify those points to parents? I think that went along with no rubrics. Well, I know that it's a, it's a lot of breaking down the stereotypes of what an education should look like. Many parents don't feel like their child is not learning if the graded worksheets aren't coming home. And so that's one of the reasons why I talked about the top of the hour, about how I really open up the doors with Instagram, Twitter, blogging, inviting them in, because I want them to see the learning that's happening and that it's not dependent on a worksheet. Um, to keep the kids motivated, um, I always share all of their projects online via social media, YouTube, my blog, whatever, um, because I want them to see that if you, because kids like positive feedback from strangers, unlike adults. We like positive feedback from people we've no one respect. Kids just want it from anybody. And so when you take their results, whether it's crappy or not, and you put it online, if it's not good and they don't get good feedback, they are embarrassed and they pick it up and they do much better the next time. And so they know we're all going to show their stuff, we're going to look at it, we're going to do this and that, and so they want their stuff to be good because they're looking for those likes and favorites and views and all this other stuff. All right, let me go back to my list. You said you, you taught 75 students, three different groups. What subjects do you teach them? I just teach math. math. I do, and I, I, I teach a third of our social studies curriculum and a third of our writing curriculum as well. My team splits that up. Mm -hmm. Is there a video example? to watch so you can see what happens the next day after a flipped classroom video was assigned? Somebody asked that they'd um, like to I see don't it in, have any kind in of, action. Yeah, I don't have any of those recorded, um, any of what my class time looks like. Um, I've gotten that request before, mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking in to try to do that this semester, uh, but we haven't gotten near that yet. Okay. When loading videos onto flash drives, what file type are you using? .mov, .mp4? Um, it's a, either it's 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 depending on whatever I quickly pulled it off the whatever device I made it on. So sometimes it's an MOV, sometimes it's an MP4. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they have a really small flash drive, I just put one video on it at a time, mm -hmm. and they just continue to bring it to me every time they need a new video. Okay. I saw another question here in chat. How do you accommodate your sensory or learning disabled students? Um, you don't have to. That's what project-based learning does. They're able to, uh, project-based learning opens it up to any kind of learning style. Um, it's because they can do the projects however they want. They just have that framework. So you're differentiating. Even working with those special education students, they're getting all this help. They're working in groups. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's beneficial for all. That's great. Do you worry about viruses or other nasty electronic things with the flash drives? Um, no, because I really don't have too many students utilize the flash drive. Okay. But no, I haven't ever worried about that because I'm not pulling anything off the flash drive. I'm just putting stuff putting on. It. on. Yeah, okay. Great. Those were the questions that I captured and that I just asked those that were typed into chat. We'll go ahead and yeah, did we miss any questions? And would anybody like to take the mic? Like Peggy's asking Stacy, would you like to take the mic before we wrap up? Like the mics and lag for Stacy. All right, I'll go ahead and go over the ending question, the ending slides. The upcoming shows for our classroom 2.0 live will be these on February 15th. It's open mic on blended learning. That's going to be facilitated by Paula Noggle. February 22nd is not yet finalized. 
March 1st. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but Paula is going to tell people about next week's show oh, because I'm very sorry. different. Thank you. Paula, go ahead and take the mic. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. We are going to try <clears throat> an open mic session next week where everyone that in, joins our um, live webinar session can participate, and we're going to facilitate a discussion on blended learning. What it is, what, do, what does it mean when you hear that word? What do you think of? What, what resources do you need to have available in your classroom in order to um, try a blended learning model? There are several out there. Have you tried any? What have been your successes? What have been your roadblocks? What have been your stumbling blocks? And we would like this to be an, um, a crowdsourced discussion of how we can either improve our blended learning model in our classroom, or for those of us who might not have ever tried it, um, give encouragement to um, give it a shot in the classroom, just like Todd did today with getting some of us who may not, might not have tried the flip or project-based learning to get out there and start small and get going with it. Todd, I am always inspired by you, and thanks for being here, and hopefully, you will join us next week and, and take part in our open mic discussion on blended learning. We would love to have everyone um, add their two cents, ask questions, even if it's just coming in taking the mic to ask a question instead of putting it in the chat. So there might be less typing next week and a little bit more of using the mic. But we want people to get comfortable with this because we are thinking about doing this every so often if it is successful next week. So hopefully you'll put it down on your calendar, um, you know, and join us for our open mic facilitated discussion on blended learning. Thanks. See you next Saturday. Thanks, Paula. February 22nd and March 1st, the topics have yet to be finalized. March 8th is the first part for Donors Choose with Laura Candler and Francie Kugelman, and then there's a follow-up on March 15th, Donors Choose Part 2, about success stories with Donors Choose. And March 22nd, Erin Klein will be the featured teacher for March. Steve Hargadon's project, newest project, is the Learning Revolution. And he's incorporating a lot of other projects of his in one place with uh, a combined event calendar and combined um, what's coming up information with all sorts of resources that he has, uh, including now a, a reintroducing the host your own webinar. You can nominate a feature teacher as Paula nominated Todd with this form, tinyurl.com slash CR2O live featured teacher nominate without the E at the end. And um, we have one feature teacher each month. When you exit the show, you ought to be taken to the CR2O live uh, survey. And um, you can also suggest topics for, for other shows there. If that survey link does not open, um, it is in the chat log now, or you can access it from any of the live binders. Uh, it's, it's there as well. Also, when you click on the survey link, you can request the professional development certificate. and. Uh, please include a personal email to have that sent. School emails sometimes block the, the certificate from reaching you. The video collection and audio collection for, for recordings from Classroom 2.0 Live are in iTunes U. And Peggy also reminded me, please double check your email address for typographical errors. Uh, otherwise, they bounce back as well. Um, so you can either watch and listen or only listen uh, to previous, previously recorded shows. 
on the Classroom 2.0 Live page, you'll find a, an RSS feed. That's another way to get um, resources from previous shows. Today's recording will be posted later today. And special thanks to uh, our special guests, Todd Nesloni, uh, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project, uh, to Weebly.com for providing the website, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you all for coming.